the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Whether you're joining us here in person or at home for the first time, or this is a long-time member thing, we welcome you with open arms of invitation and are glad to have you worshiping at Delmar Reformed Church this morning. Before we begin our service of worship, just a few announcements. First, if you're visiting with us today and would like to know a little bit more about the church, we invite you to uh, put together one of these visitor cards, fill that out, and put it in our offering a little later on. This allows us to write you a little note, correspond with you in the future. Also, if you're visiting with us online today, we invite you to take a look at more details about our church. You can find them at our website, www.drchurch.org. We, uh, in our bulletin today, you'll notice there are a number of uh, excuse me, prayer requests that are listed there. We invite you to keep these people in your thoughts and in your prayers in the coming weeks. Also, for our visitors, I forgot to mention, you'll see on the way out of either exit, there are small white bags, and they have a variety of information about the church. We encourage you to take one of those with you today on your way out of the church service. Today, we have a lot of things coming up in the life of the church. Uh, after worship today, all of our kids are invited to join Mr. Axford downstairs for chime rehearsal. We're going to be doing that over the next few weeks. More information about that in the bulletin, or just speak to him after worship. We're going to have our kids playing chimes in the weeks to come. Also, a reminder that our confirmation class, our middle school youth group, and our high school youth group all meet this afternoon and evening. Important news today. Remember, today and tomorrow, the last two days, you can pre-order your Brooks Barbecue dinner, chicken dinner. On Tuesday, we'll be hosting the Focus Churches Brooks Barbecue Dinner here at, in the parking lot from 3 to 6. If you wait until you smell the good smell and say, oh, I'd like one of those, we'll probably be sold out. So make sure to pre-order. You can see how to do that in your bulletin today. Also, you'll see information, and uh, we have an email that will be going out very soon. Uh, we had an issue with our email service this last weekend. But um, our current sexton is recovering some, from some medical issues. So for the next month for sure, and maybe longer, we're need, we have an immediate opening for a sexton position. So you can see information about that in your bulletin. That will be coming out in a newsletter next week as well. If you have any interest or would like to know more about that, it's about a 10-hour-a-week job. You can talk to Kim Gallo in the church office during the week. You're going to hear more about an upcoming mission in just a couple of weeks for Family Promise, where we host a rotating uh, shelter for those who are homeless in our county. You'll see the sign-up in the narthex right out in the lobby here. Uh, please make sure to listen a little bit for uh, our moment for mission a little later, but to sign up if you can. And finally, we are in need of some ushers for the coming weeks. So if you would like to join Mike and Mary Ann and uh, Jaina and all of those who'd like to greet people and hand out a bulletin at the beginning of the service, maybe help take collect offering, please sign up in our narthex uh, on your way to coffee hour after church today. With that, we turn our hearts and our thoughts toward God in prayer. Our help is in the name of the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Grace and peace are yours from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. A candle issue, but it's being resolved right now. So as the light is brought into the sanctuary, a reminder too that if when you came in today, you probably received one of these cards. We're all going to have the opportunity to take part in the witnessing of a baptism today. And whether you're a guest or a member, we invite you to please sign that card as a witness to what's going on, as a welcome to the wider Christian community for Paula today. Put that in the offering plate a little later on in the service. These will be collected and given to Paula's family. Please 
join with me in our call to worship. It is responsive and can be found on your, in your bulletin or on your screen at home. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Listen when I cry out to you. Hear the sounds of my longings, my God, for to you I pray. O God, you do not delight in wickedness. Evil does not get to the side of you. You destroy those who speak lies. And go forth bloodthirsty and deceitful. Let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them never sing for joy. Spread your protection over us. Let those who love you spring, sing praise. Come, let us worship the Lord. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we, opening, as we sing our opening song, Christ Arose, hymn number 224 in your red hymnals or on your screen at home. Please join with me in our prayer of confession found in your bulletin this morning. We pray together saying, Gracious God, you call us like the disciples of old to share your good news in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and in the earth. You call us to share your love, to share ourselves with our neighbors, those who like, and those who may in conflict.
receive our prayers in your mercy, God. Amen. God assures us of our forgiveness. We are promised that God is light, and in the Lord there is no darkness at all. If we say that we follow the Lord, yet walk in darkness, we deceive ourselves and live falsely. But if we walk in the light that is the Lord and ask for forgiveness as we offer it to others, we join together in Christ. Give thanks to God who is faithful to us and who enables us to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord. For friends, believe in the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. How then are we called to live as people saved by God's grace? The word of Jesus tells us, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength and with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Living according to these commandments brings honor and glory to God. Amen. Let us respond in gratitude by standing and singing the words of Glory Pachi. <laughs> I want to thank Jake for being our liturgist today and encourage all of you to continue to pray for him and for all of our confirmation students as they prepare for a profession of faith here at church on June the 2nd. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples in all, in, of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and remember that I am with you, even to the end of the age. Obeying the words of the Lord Jesus and sure of His presence with us, we baptize those whom He calls to be His own. Baptism is a sign and seal of God's promises to His covenant people. In baptism, God promises by grace alone to forgive our sins, to adopt us into the body of Christ, the church, to send the Holy Spirit daily to renew and cleanse us and to resurrect us to life eternal. The promise of baptism is made visible in water. Water cleanses. It purifies. It refreshes. It sustains. Jesus Christ is the living water. Through baptism, Christ calls us to new obedience, to love and to trust God completely, to forsake the evil of the world, and to live a new and holy life. Yet when we fall into sin, we don't despair of God's mercy, nor do we continue in sin. For baptism is a sign and seal of God's eternal covenant of grace with us. On behalf of the Board of Elders, it's my privilege to invite Kevin and Andrea Drinkwine to come forward with their daughter, Paula Beth, along with her big sister, Lynn, and to stand before God in this gathered congregation. Linda Mayu will join us not only as a proud grandmother, but also a representative of our board of elders. Kevin and Andrea, you stand before us, having brought your daughter to receive the sacrament of baptism. I ask you, therefore, before God and Christ church these questions. Do you renounce sin and the power of evil in your life and the world? Do you profess your faith in Jesus Christ and confess the faith of the church? Do you promise to instruct Paula in the truth of God's word, in the way of salvation through Jesus Christ, to raise her as a Christian, to pray for her, to teach her to pray, and to show her the joy of new life in Christ by your example, through worship and in the nurture of the church? If this is your intent, please respond by saying, we do. To our congregation gathered guests, members, those who are in town to witness this baptism, I invite you to stand if you're able. This is a time for all of us to remember baptism, to recommit ourselves to vows of discipleship. As we celebrate God's, God's ongoing care and love for all of us, do you promise to love and encourage and support Paula Beth 
to the best of your ability by teaching the gospel of God's love, by being an example of Christian faith and character, and by offering the support of God's family and fellowship, prayer, and service. If this is your response, please by saying, re- respond by saying, we do. Amen. The congregation may be seated. For those visiting from different traditions today, that's kind of a unique part of baptism in the Reformed tradition. All of us, in a sense, become what we might call godparents in the life of this child because all of us join in this community bearing witness to this baptism and the welcoming of Paula into the greater family of Jesus. I invite you to join with me in prayer. We give you thanks, O holy and gracious God, for the gift of water. In the beginning of creation, your spirit moved over the waters. In the waters of the flood, you destroyed evil. You led the children of Israel through the sea into the freedom of the promised land. In the river Jordan, John baptized the Lord and your spirit anointed him. By his death, resurrection, and and resurrection, Jesus Christ, the living water, frees us from sin and death and opens the way to life everlasting. We thank you, O God, for the gift of baptism. In this water, you confirm to us that we are buried with Christ in his death, raised to share in his resurrection, and are being renewed by the Holy Spirit. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us, so that those here baptized may be washed clean and receive new life. To you be all honor and glory, dominion and power, now and forever, through Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Linda, would you hold this for me? Mom and Dad are right there. Linda, right there. Paul Beth. It was for you that Jesus Christ came into this world. For you, he died. And for you, he conquered sin. Paula, you're a little bit too young to know anything about this just yet. But I promise you, we love because Christ loved us first. Paula Beth, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, In the name of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, Paula Beth, child of the covenant, in baptism you are sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. This child of God is now received into the visible membership of the church universal and engaged to confess the faith of of Christ and be his faithful servant until life's end. Amen. And now, Paula, I get to introduce you to your bigger church family. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you cleanse and renew Paula, your daughter, through your grace alone. Bless and strengthen her daily with the gift of your Holy Spirit. Unfold to her the riches of your love, deepening her faith, keeping her from the power of evil, and enabling her to live a holy and blameless life 
until your kingdom, kingdom comes. As you continue to strengthen her sister Lynn, look with kindness upon your parent, their parents, Andrea and Kevin. Let them ever rejoice in the gift of you have given them. Grant them the presence of your Holy Spirit, that they may bring up their daughter to know you, to love you, and to serve you. Amen. In addition to Paul's extended family, we have some really special guests who join us as ecumenical witnesses, so I'd like to invite them forward now. These are members of other churches in the Capital Area Council of Churches who come to remind us that when we baptize somebody in our church, we're not just baptizing them into this family of Christ, but the much greater family of Christ. So I invite our, our friends and uh, witnesses here today who are going to offer a special blessing for Paula. We welcome this child who was baptized into the, into the wider fellowship of Christ Church. We come representing different communities of faith, and we also come in the name of the unity of the church. For scripture tells us that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father for us all, above all, and through all, and in all. The whole community joins with this congregation, congregation in, rejoicing in rejoicing today at the, at the baptism, baptism of Paula, Paula Beth Drinkwine. Drinkwine. We, we join in surrounding this child and the child's family with Christian love and our prayers. Paula, we have two special gifts, a little cross and a little remembrance from the church. God bless you. I hope all of you have the opportunity to uh, welcome Paula into our church family. Uh, we see her almost every week, but especially today if you get a chance after worship to greet Kevin and Andrea and Paula and Lynn as we join together in the fellowship and celebration of the Christian community. As she heads to her seat, I invite Pastor Jake and all the kids forward to come on up for the children's message. What's up, friends? Isn't baptism just the best? I'm still waiting for the day when Pastor Chris carries me and walks me around the sanctuary. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet, but one day I think it will. Hey, y'all remember the seven words of baptism? Yeah. Oh, Luke, you got it? What are the seven words? A visible sign of an invisible grace. Luke said, a visible sign of an invisible grace. Thanks. <laughs> When we talk about baptism, what we're talking about is a visible sign of an invisible grace. What's the visible sign? Isis. Water. Water, Water is the visible sign. It's something we see, we, we taste sometimes, we feel. The visible sign is water. The invisible grace, the invisible good news, is that we are made clean. We are forgiven. We are welcomed into God's own family, which means that you are important. No matter what the world tells you, you have importance. Your name matters. Your story is significant. Your questions are honored. You belong. And we're reminded of that in baptism, a visible sign of an invisible grace. But I want to let you know something. It's a visible sign but sometimes, it's not about what we see, it's about, it's about what we hear. So be quiet. Listen to this. When you hear running water, the message is that you belong. You are significant. You are important. And anytime you hear water, that's what I want you to remember, okay? Baptism, a visible sign of an invisible grace, a sign that you sometimes hear. Amen? Amen. All right, friends, let's pray. I'll say a short phrase, and I'll invite you to repeat it after me. And then everyone in the sanctuary will say amen together, okay? Let's pray. God of grace, Thanks for water. Thanks for water. 
Thanks for the taste of it. The touch of it. And the sound of it. We belong. We are loved by you. Teach us to love others. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Amen. 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 Thanks, y'all. All right, kids, you're welcome to go on over to Sunday school. Everyone else, I invite you to rise and extend a word of peace to your neighbor. For those of you tuning in from home, peace of Christ be with you. This morning, I'd like to begin by thinking a little bit about stereotypes. Now, some of you are already wincing because stereotypes can be bigoted, prejudiced, racist, sexist, any kind of dehumanizing. So I'll stop here and say that any group think that dehumanizes someone else or makes them less than you, reconsider that stereotype, question it deeply. The stereotype I'm thinking about today has less to do with the way we look or where we're from, and instead considers how we react when we discover someone in our midst is facing a difficulty. Oftentimes, stereotypes come to mind in how we respond based on our gender. The way some think is that if you're a woman, you might seek to understand the problem to support the person going through it by validating the struggle that they're in. If you're a man, try and fix it. Now, rather than entrenching ourselves into the stereotypes of gender responses, today I thought it might be more helpful for us to think about the strengths and weaknesses of each approach. When we encounter someone with a problem and try and understand what they're going through, validating the experience of difficulty, Oftentimes, this approach can leave the individual struggling feeling personally appreciated and understood. When we lead with this approach, we take into account why this person is struggling. The problem might, might not be, for example, a problem for you or me, but we seek to understand why it is for them. In addition, this approach seeks to build a bond of companionship and support through the struggle. Knowing someone is there with you, especially when facing difficult circumstances, can be really helpful, knowing we aren't alone. On the other hand, if our only goal is to listen and understand, no matter how fixable a problem or situation might actually be, and sometimes they are, we might leave them unattended. Listening and understanding can be very helpful, can be the correct response However, there are some of us who don't take that approach, for when we encounter someone having a problem, some of us try and solve it, fix it, or make it better. The strength of this response is that sometimes someone in a difficult situation needs specific help. They may not want to talk about how heavy the tree branch is that's laying on top of them. They might just want you to lift it off. Hypothetically, if my long robe caused me to fall, I don't need you to ask how I feel having tripped from the pulpit in front of everybody during church. I just want you to help me up. Sometimes seeking to fix or solve is the right approach. On the other hand, this approach fails too. This is especially true for those who receive lots of emails at work. Oftentimes we're presented with an issue. Sometimes we're tempted to respond, send, and solve what we think is being presented to us. Yet it might behoove us to pause for a moment and reach out to make sure we understand the problem fully first. Because the weakness in the fix-it approach is that sometimes we try and help someone else from our perspective and not theirs. 
I think I might understand you and try and fix something for you, but when I take a moment to listen and ask questions, I might realize that the problem I'm trying to fix isn't the one that's most important. Or even more, that the problem that you're having is really evidence of something totally different. Maybe my lights aren't working because the bulb is out, so you replace it for me. But maybe it's not the bulb, but the fact that my power got shut off because I didn't pay the bill. Being too quick to fix can overlook something far more significant. As we all consider what our first reaction might be, whatever it is, we can all agree that there are benefits to balancing the way we respond when we encounter someone who seems to be struggling with a problem. This morning, we're continuing in the theme of mission and responding to the good news of the resurrection as we ponder how to respond to the needs that we encounter. Today, not in Nicaragua and with partners around the world like we heard about last week, but in ways that are focused much more closer to home. Join with me now as we turn to the story of some of the earliest followers of Jesus, now on their own after his ascension into heaven, seeking to fulfill his call to go to Jerusalem Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This morning we hear the story of Peter and John as they encounter someone facing difficulty. Let's listen to how they react to this situation and this person. Hear now the word of God, reading from Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the temple of the gate called the Beautiful Gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at the man, as did John, and said, Look at us. The man fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, But what I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. Then Peter took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your eyes. Let your Holy Spirit dwell among us at this time and in this place. Inspire these words so those who come hungry may go away filled. Amen. This morning we seek to join in unpacking the response of Peter and John to encountering someone in need. Along the way, we ask what they tried to do, the impact it had on that person, and how we might be able to replicate their model in our lives today. As our reading begins, Peter and John head to the temple at the afternoon hour of prayer. Many around Jerusalem came to the temple each day for the 9 a.m. morning hour of prayer, the 3 p.m. afternoon hour of prayer. And as they enter into the temple, we hear that they encounter a man who had a problem. This man was immobile and was not able to walk. And this wasn't from an accident, but from birth. This man had a few friends who were able to bring him to the gate of the temple in order to ask worshipers for charitable support. Now, our first reaction might be that the friends and this man, they obviously had an agenda. Yes. Yes, he does. Think of the man and the life that he leads. He can't go anywhere on his own. He can't even walk and get around. He would depend on the mercy of others just to get by day to day. He probably didn't care what their motivation was for sparing a coin or two. Guilt, grace, pity. As long as it helped him survive, he probably learned to deal with it day after day and year after year. Now, it might be significant that this man is at the temple gate 
For depending on what his condition was, that might be as far as he was allowed to go. Due to religious purity laws, some would have been excluded from even going into the very outer courtyard of the temple. Though whether or not this man was allowed a few steps further, we can be sure that in one sense or another, he was cut off from the community that it represented. As a person dependent on others, even to be able to go and beg, he surely would not have felt like he was welcomed in, much less that he could contribute to the lives of those around him. All in all, this man was facing great difficulty when Peter and John encountered him. The man likely thought they would just be like the others passing by. Hopefully he'd get a little donation out of them. He wouldn't expect anything more. But he probably saw quite a few people do even less, walking to the other side of the entrance, trying to avoid the man even in passing. Peter and John hear the man ask for help, but we notice they don't simply try and immediately fix his problem. They don't just give him money and move on. They do something more. They do something dangerous. Because it could result in continued interaction and even a relationship with this man. Peter and John truly look at the man to, to see him and his problem. And while we don't hear them asking questions to understand his point of view, we understand that they are putting themselves in his proverbial sandals. Look at us, they tell him. When the man does, they reply, we don't have the money that you're asking for, but what we do have, we now give to you. With that, they don't just help the man for a day, they change his life. In the name of Jesus, they heal the man. They don't just help him eat a meal, they provide him the ability and dignity to fend for himself. And what a response we see. This man leaps to his feet. He literally jumps for joy. And do you know what he does immediately afterward? He goes with them into the temple. His response is to join these men in fellowship, now able to join in the community of worship, leaping and praising God. The people must have noticed this exceedingly joyous man, for we're told that they're wondered and awed because they recognize him as the one who used to sit at the gate and ask for help. Peter and John are a model for us. They don't just try and fix the problem. They don't just give the man a few coins and keep it moving. They're literally and figuratively trying to see him. And in doing so, they join him in his difficulty and offer something far greater than he could have expected. Healing and restoration into a community, in worship, in fellowship, and in so many ways. Today, let us all be encouraged to respond to people facing difficulty that we see around us, just like Peter and John. Maybe we can't proclaim a miracle in the name of Jesus, yet we shouldn't sell ourselves short either. I, for one, feel pretty comfortable giving money to help people. Maybe you do, too. Maybe that's as far as we think we can go. But friends, I'm here to tell you we can do so much more. We might not be able to immediately heal a physical ailment like Peter and John once did, yet we should never overlook the power to heal emotionally and spiritually, just as Peter and John did, too. In a few moments, Hank Waller is going to share about a mission opportunity that's near and dear to my heart. Family Promise. For 20 years, every church that I've served has been part of this organization in the community I've lived in, which offers shelter to homeless families in our, uh, in our county as they transition to long-term housing. The reason I appreciate and enjoy this program so much is that all I have to do to help is to sleep one night in my own office. And you can too. But wait, there's more. Because if you wanted to really step outside your comfort zone, you can try and do something I do even when sometimes the people I'm encountering don't speak the same language that I do. For example, the last time we hosted our guests, I had dinner with a family I've been getting to know. Using Google Translator, my broken Spanish and their broken English, we laughed as we came to realize we were all really big fans of Star Wars, the movie. When I told Enrique that my dog was named after one of the characters, he hooted and replied, 
because he knew the very creature that I was talking about. Both of us made each other feel a bit more whole, a bit more part of a community, because of simple interaction we decided to engage in by the grace of God. Later in the same week, I sought to get to know a new guest who was reunited with his family after a harrowing story. Freshly arrived in the area, a teenager who had nothing but the clothes on his back, we struck up a broken conversation about a mutual passion, baseball. I teased him that I'd never heard of his favorite player, who happens to be the biggest star in the whole sport, and I realized that maybe his transition to a new place could by ease by connecting him along with his uncle with something familiar when he asked if I knew anybody with a spare baseball glove. All it took was a donation of two well-loved baseball gloves and a couple of baseballs to the Family Promise Day Center, and now maybe they can feel a sense of place and familiarity in a new place. A conversation, a shared passion, a contribution out of surplus, and both of us are now connected into a community which we weren't before, by God's grace. Was I trying to heal? Was I being healed? Maybe both. What I do know is that God's blessings of healing and community are all around us, waiting for us to accept the invitation to be part of miracles large and small, whether we seek to understand, whether we seek to fix, when we respond to others facing difficulty, just like Peter and John once did. Sisters and brothers in Christ, God is at work. We're invited to join in that good work, that resurrection living, sharing new life and healing with those we encounter. And the awesome thing, so often like Peter and John, we don't have to offer that which we are unable to offer. Instead, we might simply be called to heal and be healed by sharing what we do have. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. As we consider the grace that's been shared with us, I invite you to stand in body or in spirit to join us at home on your screen or here in person as we sing Alleluia, Sing to Jesus, number 233 in your hymnal.
as Pastor Chris hinted at in his sermon, this month we're calling a month for mission. We're highlighting one of our local mission partners or perhaps regional or global mission partners in worship each week. And today, I'm going to invite my friend and neighbor, Hank Waller, up to share a little bit about family promise. Last week, Peggy Becker talked to us about CEPAD Nicaragua, which is one of our global mission partners. Today, Hank's going to share about what's going on here in our own county, as, as local as it can get. So, Hank, why don't you tell us a little bit about Family Promise? All right, thank you. What a great service this morning, and I get to talk a few minutes about something extremely close to my heart, which is Family Promise. You hear a lot about Family Promise, but a little bit to know a little bit more. Family Promise is a national organization. It's located in 43 states right now and has about 200 uh, affiliates, of which we're one of them in the Albany area. Uh, DRC is a founding church, one of the founding churches of the, uh, of the, um, what do you, of the uh, affiliate. Yeah. Yes, there we go. Yeah. So um, how does it work? Well, the local affiliate has 13 churches associated with it, right? And as part of the 13 churches, each church takes four weeks. So if you do the math, 13 weeks, uh, 13 churches, four weeks, you get 52 weeks covered. So with that, each week is covered and works with uh, the affiliate. So what happens is the churches take the families at night. They're usually dropped off around 530 at the, uh, at the church, and they're picked up the next morning around 7, 730 by van. Typically, we house up to three or four families uh, at a time. During the day, as Pastor Chris mentioned, there's a day center. And the day center is located over at Bethany Church. And the families really work out of the Bethany Church day center during the day. So if there's kids, they go to, the school, they go to school pretty much and enroll into the Albany schools. If they're adults and they have jobs, they leave there to go to get their jobs. Or they're looking for jobs uh, through there. Also, the day center supports um, medical, um, legal, if, there's, uh, if, there, if the families are looking for uh, legal help in terms of maybe asylum seeking, and uh, social services. So that all occurs out of the day center during the day. It's important to remember why does Family Promise exist? The purpose is to keep the family together when they're homeless. If this program didn't exist, those families would probably break up on the streets because the kids would be, uh, go to maybe foster care or, or uh, children's shelters, the moms would be into women's shelters, the dads most likely would be on the streets at night or during the day and hopefully finding shelters at night. So what's so cool about this is we get to keep the families together, bring them into shelter, and, ho and work with them to find a path to s sustainability in the future. Typically families are in the program three to nine months and the success rate is huge. We started on 2015, well, as a founding church, we were involved a couple years before that in terms of getting the program up and flying. Um, the first day it opened was, two, uh, first year it opened was 2015, and since then, 50 families have successfully gone through the program, come through the doors right back here at our church, and all the, others, uh, the other 12 churches, and uh, have successfully come through the program. It's just a, it's just a phenomenal feeling. So what happens when they're here? When, you, when they're here, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the van drops off at 5:30. Karen Empey and I were the uh, coordinators. We meet the van. We kind of consider ourselves the, the uh, innkeepers. We want to see them get off, ask them how their day is, and they get off the van. They get off the van. Uh, they we uh, they go downstairs. Um, the there's classrooms downstairs are turned into guest rooms, either downstairs or upstairs, depending on how many people we have. So we create guest rooms for them. Six to eight is dinner time, uh, so we look for volunteers to come in from six to eight to make food and, and have a dinner time with them, and then eight to seven a.m. the next morning, 8 p.m. to seven, as the overnight chaps, we call them chaperones, and they basically sleep over, put out the food, uh, breakfast in the morning, and make the coffee. That's key because Ish, the van driver, loves to come in about quarter to seven, <laughs> have a chat with you, drink some coffee, and see how things are going. So the overnights, and we usually look for a male and a female, and they get to stay in the, uh, in the offices. Um, the other p component of all this is that on the weekends, we look for somebody to, uh, on Sunday morning, on Sunday afternoon, set up the rooms, so the following Sunday take down, and then to do some laundry uh, on the following Sunday. Kind of talks about how it works. 
Why do I do it? I've been involved in this since the beginning. And as Pastor Chris mentioned, it's just a wonderful feeling to be able to meet these people, help them. They're dropped off right at our back door. It provides 24-7 program here in this church. The church is alive, using it uh, around the clock. And what's cool about it is, is when the families are here, they're interacting with the other programs going on here. Uh, there's so much that goes on here during the week that these fa families get to see that, experience it. We provide a safe, secure location. We provide shelter for them. We provide food for them. And as Chris mentioned, Pastor Chris, me Pastor Chris mentioned, we get to, uh, we get to uh, learn from them. We get to hear their stories a bit and uh, just gain so much from it. So it's a phenomenal program. We appreciate all the help that's uh, occurred over the 10 years and folks that volunteer. We encourage more volunteers. And uh, we will take any new volunteers and combine them with uh, folks that have done it before. Thank you. Awesome. Let's give Hank a hand. Thank you. So good. Thank you, Hank. April 28th is the day these folks come. That's in a couple Sundays. Today's the 14th. Two weeks from today, the families come, and they stay throughout that week. So from April 28th through May 5th, those are the specific dates we're looking for volunteers. Help with setup, help sleeping overnight as a, just an emergency supervisor if need be, and uh, preparing a meal. So if you are interested and able in doing any of those things, the sign up is out in the narthex. The lobby is a whiteboard right there. Just take the marker and put your name uh, in a given spot, and we would appreciate all the help we can get. Uh, it's just really an amazing partnership that we've developed here, and we want to keep it going strong. Okay. We're at that point in the service where we take a moment to remind ourselves that one of the fundamental characteristics about who God is, is that God is generous. God is generous with giving God's self to us in love and relationship and promises. And the plates that we pass around are symbols that help us remember that. We have an opportunity to give financially, uh, but it ought to enliven our imaginations Monday through Saturday as to how we can live generously in and for the world. So our ushers are going to be passing these plates down here in a second. If you're tuning in from home and you're interested in supporting the financial life of the church, make your way over to drchurch.org and hit the Give tab in the top right corner. If you're a visitor with us today, this is the moment when you can drop that visitor card in the offering plate as it goes by. There's absolutely no expectation of a financial gift. Um, and also, those baptism, baptism cards, the signing the witnesses to Paul's baptism, who is KO'd over here, by the way, I put it asleep. Um, you can put those cards in the plate as it goes by as well. Come, let us take of the offering.
God, we praise you today as the giver of all good gifts, both those small and those that are so much larger than we even know. Teach us to receive your gifts anew and teach us to extend them to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, I invite you to remain standing as we continue in the spirit of offering, offering the words of our faith as they're recorded in the Apostles' Creed. Uh, you can find those words in your hymnals, number 359. Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary, the Son of the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven. Seated at the right hand of God, you will come and judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the readiness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. <clears throat> God of our baptism, we praise you as the one who cleanses, purifies, refreshes, and sustains both us and your good world. So cleanse us this morning of any evil that lingers within us. Cleanse us of our willingness to deceive, to slander, to be violent with our words and our actions toward those we simply misunderstand. Cleanse your good creation from the things that lead to its destruction. War, greed, exploitation, a never-ending need to satisfy our cravings to consume. God, cleanse your good, good world. Purify it. This world is the place in which you chose to make your home. And you invite us to find a home here too. So purify it toward that purpose. Purify your good world to become a place of peace, security, rest, and growth all the things that are meant to unfold inside a home. Purify each one of us too. Create in us a single-minded concern for you and your work of renewal in the world. God, you are on the move in making all things whole. So purify us that we might participate in that good work. Refresh us. As bad news of prolonged violence and mounting death tolls echoes from our screens, refresh us. Nurture in us a deep, deep sense of hope. Hope that you really do have all things under control, God. Hope that you really do have something good in store for us. Hope that you really are able and willing to cleanse this world of all injustice. Hope that each one of us really is significant in a world that makes us feel so small. Sustain us. As we open ourselves up to you and your presence of hope, sustain us. Sustain us when we find it hard to believe. Sustain us when we find it hard to love, hard to be loved. Sustain us when we find our work exhausting, our relationships fragile, our bodies worn down. God, sustain us and sustain your good world. One day, people from every nation and language will be gathered together in worship of you, God, creator of a new heaven, a new earth. 
until that worshipful gathering and new creation sustain your good world. Teach us to be a sustaining presence on your earth too. As you do that, we'll continue to pray in the way that Jesus taught us, joining in one voice, praying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive our debtors. It's not it's a temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I invite you all to rise again in body or in spirit as we sing our closing hymn, Thine is the Glory, hymn number 218 in your red hymnals. Remember your baptism. A visible sign of an invisible grace. We receive that and now we embody that for the good of the world. We can live as the visible sign of God's invisible grace. So go out from this place. Seek to understand the depths of problems and also be committed to solving those along the way. As you do, go in the grace of God the Father the fellowship of Christ the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Go in peace.